Hi, everyone. Um, well, before we get started, uh, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Frederick, and I'm the author of The Black Friend on Being a Better White Person. Uh, so we'll discuss that today, uh, along with um, some other things about me and, and the book, obviously. But before we get started, I see that there's a lot of people in here from all over. So I just want to shout um, out where people are from. Um, first, I see we have people from Chicago, uh, students from California, uh, students from Minnesota, uh, Milwaukee, Riley, North Carolina, uh, and Seattle, Washington. Uh, actually, my fiance is from Seattle. So uh, a huge shout out to, to Seattle for that one. Um, so, you know, today we're going to talk about, like I said, my book, uh, but but not just, um, you know, what the book's about, but also why I wrote the book. Um, so I think we'll just jump right in now. So The Black Friend on Being a Better White Person is an anti-racist book. Um, the goal of the book is to teach young people, well, general people and people in general, but especially young people about not just the history of racism and, and race in America and globally, uh, but some of the daily things that happen because of racism. Oftentimes these things are called microaggressions. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what microaggressions are, what that term means, and again, why I wrote the book. So let's start out with why I wrote the book. So when I was in school, uh, and, and I see not a lot has changed now, sadly, but when I was in school, we learned some things about race and uh, racism occasionally. You know, um, maybe we would read a book here or watch a film there, uh, but there wasn't much conversation about it. And because there wasn't much conversation about it, there were a lot of really traumatic, hurtful, mean things that people were doing um, to other students and even educators were doing to some of their students. Uh, some of them were intentional and some of them weren't. Um, but I, I truly believe that the more that we know about not hurting each other and, and the things that um, you know we do that could be wrong, even again, if unintentional, uh, the less we'll do them, right? So I said to myself, if I write a book that isn't just about the history of race and racism, but but more so about the ways in which people can be hurt and harmed by daily instances of racism, big and small, you know, would that give people, especially students, the opportunity to be better, right? And and not just be better, but would it give students the opportunity to feel seen, right? Um, so again, let's let's talk about you know what those instances are, and like I mentioned before, the word microaggressions. So a microaggression is basically any instance of uh, a trauma or something painful or or something um, wrong that is done to marginalize people, and and marginalized people can be um, people who are black. Um, people who are in the LGBTQ plus community, um, women, um, people uh, living under certain economic uh, circumstances. So it's it's issues and 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 behaviors happening to them from people in other communities. So let's say, for instance, you take me. I'm I'm black, um, and someone does something such as assumes that I play on the basketball team because I'm black and they and they have a stereotype that every black person um, has the ability to play basketball, right? As opposed to asking me, um, you know, what my interests are and I can tell them whether I play basketball or not. So that stereotype, um, that assumption there and the person asking me that or saying that I must play basketball could be considered a microaggression. So this book, that I've written discusses things like that, right? The daily things that happen in that way that a lot of people don't even realize that they're doing. So, you know, I, I wanna give one example from the book itself um, about that. So when I was in elementary school, I was one of the, I, I, I'll be honest, I'll be, I was one of the two smartest kids in my class. You know, at nine years old, I was, uh, a, a wonderkin. I'm not as smart now, but back then I, I was really smart. 
And the other person in class who was kind of my rival um, was a young uh, Southeast Asian girl. And, you know, we would get, I mean, we would get hundreds on literally every single test, hundreds and A's. Uh, and and our, our teacher, she knew that. She, she had been our teacher for most of the year. And she just knew um, that we were really good students. We also happened to be two of the only non-white students in the class. So what happened was um, our teacher, she ended up being pregnant. So she went out on what's called maternity leave. And maternity leave, um, depending upon what country you're in or what state you're in, um, you know, is when people who are pregnant um, get the opportunity to take time off from work or time off from various things that they're doing um, to rest and focus on having um, their baby. So because my teacher went out on maternity leave, they brought in a substitute teacher. And that substitute teacher uh, had no familiarity uh, with myself or um, the other student in class who were who was one of the top students in the class. So we took a test um, and when we took the test, as we always did, we both got hundreds on the test. And when we got a hundred on the test, perfect score, the substitute teacher assumed that we were cheating on the exam. And, you know, you can ask yourself, well, why did she assume that we were cheating on the exam? I didn't understand it either at the time. Well, it ended up that she was assuming that we were cheating because we weren't white. And she couldn't believe that the smartest kids in class weren't the white kids, right? Ob like for many of you, that would sound like an obvious um, wrong assumption. But for her, it wasn't, right? It wasn't a wrong assumption but it was a deeply painful one. So what ended up happening was because she assumed that we were cheating, she made us retake the test. And when she made us retake the test, she actually stood over us and watched us take the test. That's a, that's a lot of pressure. I'm sure um, as most of you know on here, just taking a test in general is a lot of pressure. Um, but taking a test with your teacher watching you, there isn't much more pressure than that. So I was scared because I didn't understand what I did wrong. I had been getting great grades all year and I got another great grade. Why was I getting in trouble for that? So I did poorly on the test because I was so nervous. And then honestly, I kind of put together, hey, whenever I do good in this class, the teacher doesn't like it and I get embarrassed. So I'm gonna stop doing good in this class. I don't, I don't wanna be a good student when it comes to this class and this teacher. So I did poorly the rest of the year. I didn't know how to explain the situation to my mother. Um, I didn't know how to defend myself. And, and there weren't really um, any systems in place for me to go speak to someone about what was going on. So I just kind of kept going with that, right? I was just like, okay, let me just get a lower grade throughout the rest of the year and she'll leave me alone. And, and that happened until you know I went on to the next grade level. But I was looking back on that um, when I was writing this book, and the reason why I bring that up is because some of you have faced experiences like that, maybe not with cheating, um, but the assumption that based on who you are, um, you can't do certain things or you're not supposed to do certain things um, based on you being a person who is Black, based on you being Asian, based on you being Latinx, based on you being um, a woman or a, or, a, or a young woman, based on you being anything, right? That people make these false stereotypes about you. So I discuss a lot of that, a lot of that throughout the book because it's important for us to learn, right? It's important for us to learn about not only our differences, but about the behaviors that are honestly holding back all of us, frankly. Um, before I continue, I've also uh, noticed that there are people from South Wales, uh, Canada, I love Canada, um, Virginia, Florida, Connecticut, Denver, Alaska, Iowa. Thank you all for being here. Um, deeply appreciate it. So anyway, back to um, the conversation uh, about the book. So throughout the book, while I'm explaining some of these behaviors and talking about some of these experiences, I also wanted to make sure that 
people are just reading about my experiences and my opinions. So I invite a ton of my friends um, to be interviewed in the books, uh, in the book. Some of them you might actually be familiar with. Uh, one of the big ones um, is Angie Thomas, who wrote the book, The Hate You Give, um, and most recently, um, the number one New York Times bestseller, uh, Concrete Rose. If you haven't read Angie's books, I definitely suggest you do. But, um, you know, Angie and I had a very interesting conversation uh, that I think um, all of you will understand. So if you haven't heard of the term colorblindness, um, basically I'll explain. So colorblindness in relation to race is when people say, I don't see your race, we're all the same. Well, the issue with that, as it might sound good on the surface, the issue becomes inherently by being a different race than other people, right? Let's say I'm black and you watching this, you're white or, or something, some other race that's not black. We all have different experiences. If you don't see me being a black person, it doesn't change my experiences for being a black person. And therefore, instead of actually doing something to support me, you're actually invalidating me and erasing me, frankly, right? If I, if I said, hey, you know what? Um, that teacher that we have, uh, she thinks that I'm cheating because I'm black. And you're like, well, I don't see race. Well, you not seeing race doesn't change my experience. In fact, it makes it even worse because instead of being an ally and helping me out in a situation, you're basically making the situation more difficult because now I have to explain to you why it's important that you not do that and deal with the original thing that I'm bringing to you. So as I said, Angie and I, we discussed that topic and she gives a really good example of colorblindness. And, I, and again, I think you'll all understand. So let's say someone is writing a book about time travel and they have a group of young people and they travel back to I don't know, the 1950s in America. During the 1950s in America, it was a very different place than right now. Uh, you had things such as Jim Crow and segregation, you know, where um, black people weren't allowed to be um, in the same spaces, drink from the same water fountains, use the same bathrooms as white people. So let's say you were writing this book about time travel and all the characters you write, let's say there's three characters and each one of them is white, and you make them travel back to the 1950s from 2021. Well, their experiences in 1950 might be different from 2021, but their experiences won't be based on race probably, right? Because back then they could use the bathroom in the same places that they can now, they can eat at the same restaurants, drink from the water fountains, so on and so forth. But let's say you decided to be colorblind. You said, ah, I'm gonna make one of the characters black. And I'm just gonna change, I'm gonna change out one of the white characters, make them black because, you know, it's all the same thing. But it's not the same thing, right? Because as I said before, in the 1950s, a black person couldn't drink from the water fountains, couldn't use the same bathrooms, couldn't eat at the same restaurants. So your, your book would then, and your story would then be false and, and wrongfully written because you're not actually talking about the true experiences of the black character and what they would actually be going through based on the situation and circumstances of that time. And that's an example of how colorblindness doesn't actually help but hinders. So, you know, generally that's that's the direction um, that the book uh, takes and, and, and why I thought it was important to write about that because, you know, we have a lot of phenomenal books that exist, books like uh, stamped by Dr. Ibram Kendi and, and Jason Reynolds. We have um, books on, um, you know, the history, again, of race and, and, and racism um, in America and around the world. But we don't really talk a lot about, you know, how does racism show up when you're in class? How does racism show up when you're watching movies? How does, how does racism uh, show up when you're, you know, maybe the black girl in class and everyone wants to touch your hair. Why is that not a good thing? Why is it important not to do that, right? Why is it important? It, you know, there's a lot of people here from other countries and a lot of people from all over uh, America. Why is it important that you actually get people's names correct, right? 
if someone is Southeast Asian, why do why why is it important that you pronounce their name correctly? Well, because it shows them dignity, it shows them respect, it shows them appreciation. And again, the book discusses things like that that a lot of other books um, aren't. So, you know, I'm I'm hoping that uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to read the book, that uh, you get a chance um, because the the focus is. Um, on young people and helping you get it right. And um, for those of you who are, are not young um, young white people, uh, the, the hope is that you'll feel seen uh, throughout the book because I'm sure that uh, many of you, even if you don't realize it, have had some of these experiences where um, you're underestimated um, or dealing with traumas um, in your daily life based on being, um, you know, Black or Latinx or or Southeast Asian, um, you know, so on and so forth, uh, Native American. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that when all of you get a chance to read um, the book, uh, that you'll, you'll not only learn, but again, um, feel seen as well. So, you know, I can, I can go on forever talking about the book, but I want to eventually get into some, some questions. I'm sure many of you have questions about anti-racism and inclusion and and race in general so we'll we'll get to some of that um but the first thing uh that i want to do that i'm i'm super excited to do actually is you know we're gonna take a selfie as a matter of fact we're, we're gonna start off with um a selfie because you know it, it helps for me at least it, it not only is a, is a good memory for all of us together but it, it helps loosen us up, right? These are these are not easy conversations. Uh, this is not an easy topic, um, but you know, taking a good selfie always lightens the mood. So uh, what we're gonna do in a second is um, I'm gonna put um, the book up in um, the air. Well, not in the air, but I'm gonna hold the book up um, and we're gonna take a selfie. And what I want you to do is on Twitter and Instagram, um, my handle is at Fred T. Joseph, and, you know, I'm going to share a bunch of the selfies that we take. Uh, the same goes for Flipgrid, who you can follow at uh, Flipgrid, um, and Candlewick Class, um, you know, one word, Candlewick Class. And if you're using the hashtag for um, the selfie, it's hashtag Flipgrid for all. So let's get started on the selfies. So I'm going to hold the book up. And you just get ready. I'm going to do a bunch of different poses. So this is my first one. <laughs> my second one. My third one. Oh, we can't really see the book there. So. Okay. Let's see. I'm going to hold it for a few more seconds. Everybody get your selfies in. Don't forget. Um, myself, Flipgrid, and Candlewick, we will be sharing these. All right. All right, about three more seconds. <laughs> All right, great. So again, uh, make sure that you at Flipgrid on Twitter and Instagram, at Fred T. Joseph and Candlewick Class. I'm gonna use the hashtag Flipgrid for all. And we're gonna be sharing these selfies out, um, not only on social media, um, but I'm actually going to share some of them um, in um, a few other materials that I have. And I'm excited to see um, what you um, come up with in terms of your selfies. So let's dive right into Q and A. I, I feel as though Q and A for me is always more important um, and and just more fun than just hearing me you know talk um, constantly. So uh, let's get to the first question. All right. So Kira asks, in your book, are your experiences displayed in a character? Um, so throughout the book, I use um, my own experiences and. Um, you know, so there are plenty of characters in it. Um, some of the, some, they're all based on real people and, and real people from my own um, life. Um, the, I've changed some of the names um, to, to avoid um, people being uh, angry about, you know, using their names in the book. Um, but, you know, all the experiences are displayed through, um, you know, characters that I've, I've, you know, basically known in real life. 
Okay, uh, question from Nancy. You mentioned Stamp by Ibram X. Kendi and Jason Reynolds. Um, how might your book align with theirs? You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think that if there was a process, I would read uh, Stamped and then I would read The Black Friend. Because I, I think that Stamped, again, gives historical context, right? Stamped discusses the ideas of, of race, right? Um, the history of of race, like, you know, as as uh, Dr. Kennedy says, um, you know, racist ideas and how they came to be. My book is about the daily manifestations of those racist ideas. So if, you know, we know that slavery um, existed, right? But then how does slavery end up having a through line to the classroom, right? Or to our experiences as young non-white people, right? If we say like, oh, you know, um, we have to do something about police brutality and here's the history of police brutality. Well, my book discusses the actual experiences of those dealing with um, police brutality um, in nuanced ways, right? And in a specific example, they weren't really police officers, but um, me dealing with over-policing from security guards while trying to do something as simple as um, you know, go to the mall. Though in that one experience, I was doing a little bit more than going to the mall, but you'll read the book. So, um, Kara asks, what made you choose that title? You know, so the title The Black Friend was something that um, I chose because oftentimes people from marginalized communities, um, you know, are, are tokenized, right? And what tokenized means is People will use who you are, right? Like, like if you are a an Asian, um, a person who's Asian, um, a person might say, "Well, I can do that thing because my Asian friend said I could." Even though it it hurts you or is problematic to you, one Asian person that they're using to tokenize um, to basically say there's nothing wrong with their behavior, um, and that happens a lot of times with Black people, where you know non-Black people will have a black friend, um, and they'll use that black friend as a um, shield for criticism about their behaviors. So I said, well, what if you did have a black friend, but that black friend was actually focused on you getting things right? That black friend was actually like someone good in your life who was making you, you know, make positive change. So that's where the idea and the title for um, the book came from. Ken asked, while being colorblind isn't a good thing, how do you deal with the concept of race when talking to someone who is literally blind? Well, you know, that's interesting because I think that in my experience, um, even a person who is blind, um, you know, has learned um, over time, if they're a certain age, what race is, right? And that in our world, there are people who, um, who have different experiences based on their race. So them being um blind and, and unable to see someone's race um, doesn't necessarily um, change the fact that the person who's experiencing the, the things based on their race um, any different, right? So if I was talking to um, a person and like, well, I don't see that you're black because I'm blind, well, it still doesn't change my experiences. So you you acknowledging that I'm black is still an important thing if you are if you're if you're non-black. So either way, it doesn't necessarily change um, the direction of of the learning. Question from Miss E. The example you gave about your rare um, good experience with a white family, Tyler's family, was helpful to this white person. Another example of what you should uh, what you should do. Um, hmm. An example, I'm imagining that the example is what you should do. Sorry, the, que the question throws me um, a little bit. So, uh, Miss E, if you want to reframe the question, one of the moderators will choose the question um, when it's reframed a little bit. I, it could just be me reading it in the wrong way. Um, question from Heidi. What gives you hope during challenging times? P.S. Thank you for your service as a writer. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Heidi. Um, you know, what gives me hope during um, during these challenging times is honestly young people. I, I think that there is hope because the generations um, that are coming up after me, I mean, you're all so, so brilliant. And I wish that I had 
the 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 learning and the ambition and the connectivity um, that you all have. You know, one example of how much is changing, um, I can give an example from a first hand experience. I was protesting um, against uh, police brutality. Um, police brutality is basically, for those of you who don't know, police brutality is when um, police, whether in, in my country or around the world, um, you know, do things that are outside of um, of their of their of their scope of work. Basically, things that they aren't supposed to be doing, and oftentimes that means um, hurting, harming, or murdering um, people who are who are not doing anything wrong. Or, or frankly, honestly, you don't even have to be doing um, anything wrong um, uh, for the police to. Um, Sorry, I'm trying. I'm trying. So I'm trying to explain this in a way where I can make young people understand this best. A police officer's job is to uphold the law. It is not a police officer's decision to murder or not murder people. Um, it is a police officer's job to basically um, stop crime from happening. Oftentimes, police do more than they are supposed to be doing um, based on the law, and they'll do things such as. Um, murder people or harm people um, for no reason whatsoever um, and is usually based on racism, um, based on sexism, um, and based on classism. Uh, so that's police brutality. Back to the point. Um, over the summer, I was protesting against police brutality after um, George Floyd was murdered and after Breonna Taylor um, was murdered by police. Um, and what I saw was that young white people who were also protesting because they knew that some police officers oftentimes will be um, physically harmful to black people, they were stepping in front of black people to make sure that the police weren't hitting them, weren't touching them, or rather touching us or harming us, because the young white people knew that the police were unlikely to do that to them. So imagine um, on, on all sides of the protests, surrounded by young white people protecting us essentially from the police. Things like that give me hope. Uh, John in Milwaukee says, we were thinking of expanding some work into student groups in our schools. Do you have any discussion guides or anything for students? Do you find that white students and black or brown students engage with the book similarly, or is it best experienced in racial affinity groups? You know, I, I've I've found that working backwards, the book seems to be it, it sits differently with different students because oftentimes the students who are black or brown um, they feel seen through the book. You know, I, I think back to one young uh, Chicana girl um, who read the book and she was on a on a conversation with me. She she thanked me for writing the book because she's the only non-white student in her honors class, and this book gave her the words that she didn't have. Um, and gave her a voice that she was looking for, she said. Um, you know, her, her teacher read it as well and started rethinking what she might be experiencing as the only non-white student in that class. So a lot of the work of the book um, is received as representation um, and feeling seen for black and brown students. For white students, you know, I've, I've gotten messages from a lot of white students who are, who are thankful um, for the book because Honestly, they were doing things that they had no clue were wrong, right? And and that's the reality of it. Um, and why, as I said earlier, microaggressions um, are aren't always intentional, right? These young students never learned some of the things that are in this book, and we typically don't teach them in classrooms. So they've received it overwhelmingly with appreciation for getting the opportunity to stop, you know, with behaviors that are hurting people who oftentimes they love or respect. Um, and in terms of any discussion guides or anything for students, so there's actually a teacher's guide written for the book um, by the brilliant educator, uh, Sonia Cherry Paul, who um, is also writing um, the book Stamped for Kids. So I would definitely check that out. And I think that it provides wonderful direction for um, working with students um, in regards to the book. Uh, Miss E's reframe question. Can you give another example of how you would like uh, white people to engage with you besides a racist ally? Um, example you gave um, with uh, Tyler's family. Yeah, so, you know, 
for me, you know, in the book, I, I discuss this idea of being an accomplice as opposed to an ally. Um, and I'll explain that right now. So there's a brilliant author, author. Her name is Mickey Kendall. She wrote a book called Hood Feminism. And for those of you who are students who are um, a little bit older, maybe 15 and up, um, I would definitely suggest uh, getting Hood Feminism if you have the opportunity. It's a, it's a wonderful book. Um, but she said once, um, you know, we don't need allies as black people. We don't need allies. We need accomplices. And I love that. I love that idea because what I see an accomplice is uh, is as um, is a person who instead of just saying like, hey, I'm going to post a black square on social media because there's something wrong happening in the world. And this makes me feel good because I posted a black square acknowledging that something's happening. Well, the reality is posting a black square doesn't necessarily change the world, right? As we saw over the summer, people posted black squares and yet still um, black people were murdered unjustly right after. Because the issues that we're facing are huge issues, right? They're systemic issues. And because of that, we need big change, systemic change. And doing something like posting a black square doesn't create that. So what I tell people all the time is the way I like people to engage with me is through action, right? And I think that that's what most people who are non-white and suffering from oppression um, would like as well. If you want to actually do something, then actually do something. You know, assess what your privileges are, assess what your resources are. If you're someone who has some free time, volunteer with an organization um, that helps you know, the fight against racism. Um, if you're someone who has resources, um, whether that's financial or something else, you know, support black authors, for instance, right? It's, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, Mickey and, and Angie and their books because I want people to buy the books, right? And I want people to share the books and, and learn along the way, right? You know, so that's how you actually, you know, make change. And that's how I want people to, you know, work with me and in, in, in ways that we can actually create change as opposed to just talking about change. Let's see. How would you suggest slash recommend young people engage in conversations with people about the topics in an educated manner? Well, I, I think that, you know, we can't un ever underestimate how intelligent young people are. Most young people I know are far smarter than I am. Uh, so I think give young people the tools to learn and then the engagement from that is pretty easy, right? Like if a young person has read my book, I am 100% sure that the conversation that we have post reading my book um, you know, frames itself. And, 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 you know, and, and I think that in an educated manner, you know, again, you just have to give them the opportunity to become educated on a topic. So it's, it's up to us as, as adults to create the work and put young people into positions um, to have said educated conversations. We have to make sure that they get educated. In your book, do you talk about recent experiences? I do. Actually, um, you know, the book was written in 2019, um, but I, I couldn't avoid and I didn't want to avoid <laughs> writing about um, all the experiences that took place during um, 2020. You know, we have are suffering from a pandemic. We have faced, um, you know, some of the most uh, important protests in modern history. Um, you know, so on and so forth. So I, I discussed some of that. I went back and wrote a preface um, about all of that um, in the form of a letter um, to my now nine-year-old brother, who um, my book is also dedicated to. You know, I, I, I wrote the book with him in mind, you know, a young Black child in hopes that the things that I suffer from in this book he'll never have to experience um, because there's books like this and and work being done like this in the world. But I but all that to say, yeah, I, I do touch on um, some more recent experiences. Um, and I think generally the experiences throughout the book, um, sadly, um, they haven't changed much in terms of what people deal with right now either way. Um, Natasha asks, what is your favorite book of all time? Ooh, 
That's a good question. Um, my favorite book of all time. Huh. I'll be honest. Um, I've kind of stepped away um, for various reasons recently from um, J.K. Rowling, but my favorite book of all time uh, as a series is Harry Potter. Um, that's that's the honest truth. I, I guess my favorite book um, in terms of um, certain kind of like historical context, maybe based on like anti-racism or something like that. Huh. Anything by James Baldwin. Honestly, I love, love um, James Baldwin. Uh, Mrs. Yaz's fourth and fifth graders asked, are you planning on writing any other books? I am, actually. Um, I, I just uh, just got the opportunity to sign two new book deals. Um, so my second book is going to be for adults, um, though I'm sure some of you on, on here will be able to read it as well. And, and for Mrs. Yaz's fourth and fifth graders, you'll be able to read it eventually. Um, and that's called Patriarchy Blues. And that book focuses on me thinking about and talking about um, very advanced concepts, uh, theoretically, um, things like patriarchy and toxic masculinity. Uh, which which is a whole nother conversation um but, but so i'll skip to the next book uh you know the other book that i'm writing is actually a follow-up to the black friend um it's called better than we found it and um it's another ya again follow-up to the black friend um and i'm excited because i'm actually co-authoring that with my fiance and that book um mrs yaz's fourth and fifth graders can read um is all about various things going on in the world, various important topics, and helping young people especially um, understand them. Things from um, healthcare reform to the importance for gun control, um, ableism, uh, homophobia, all these really big ideas that young people are seeing, hearing, and passing reading about online, um, basically put into one place to help people understand all of them um, and hopefully make change when it comes when, in relation to them. Kiki asks, advice for, uh, for folks who live in super not diverse areas. You know, I, I think for people who don't live in diverse areas, which is um, many of us, I don't live in a diverse area, um, sadly, I think the change and, and, it, and it has to start with you. Right. You know, for me, I, I tell people often, if you live somewhere that's not diverse, if you live somewhere that's not working on anti-racism, somewhere that where people are working on um, anti-bigotry and anti-hatred and things like that, do it yourself. Right. You start it. Start it and, and you know, search for the people who, even if they aren't getting it right or, or getting it as good as you are, they want to start. You lead some of that, you know. You take you take that um, and run with it. You know you have to be the one in that instance to to lead the change. And and you know that's a very beautiful and special thing to be able to do. So that's my advice. You start making it more diverse. Um, you start making it um, a better place. So uh, let's see. <laughs> Mrs. Yaz's fourth and fifth graders also asked. Did you illustrate the cover yourself? No, I did not. The cover is absolutely beautiful. Um, and it was done by a young woman named Zaria Shin. Uh, so I suggest that all of you um, go to her website if um, you have a chance and check out some of her work. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. She is such a, a talented person. So I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions, if there are any, um, and I would love to answer them if you have um, any questions. Um, and then I will let you all get, get back to your day and we'll talk more soon, I'm sure. So let's see what our last questions are. Okay, do you have any advice for someone who is trying to write their own book? Yeah, my advice for someone trying to write their own book is start. If you haven't started, just start. Just, you know, get to writing, get to doing it. And, and you know, frankly, then you got to just be willing to put in um, the effort to find the, the people who are supportive of the book, right? Email anyone you can find who might want to work with you on getting the book seen and published. I mean, everyone, right? That's the first part, like I said, is, is writing it or working on the proposal for it. 
but the real the real work after you do the writing is i'm sure that you love writing if you're writing a book the real work comes in having the hustle determination and ambition um to believe in yourself and 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 get other people um to believe in you uh and you know sometimes it might seem really hard especially if you're getting you know i've gotten rejections for a lot of books and ideas and um that's just the reality of it but i believed in myself and so i keep on pushing all right so the last question do you feel like you're living through history right now wow that is such a good question for the final question i do but i, I think history is every moment that we're living right because if you think about it when you look back on your life, whether you've been here and you know for 10 years, whether you've been here for 20 years or you've been here for 80 years, something is going on around you, something is happening, something important that you can look back on. You know, you could be making history yourself right now and don't realize it, right? Like when I was writing this book, I didn't think that I was gonna be here with all of you right now. I just knew that I wanted to write the book. When I was writing the book, I didn't know that the you know, the protests of 2020 were going to happen. I just knew that it was important to write the book based on the things that had happened already. So I think that history is constantly happening, but but I think that, you know, specific to this moment, this moment is, you know, it's different than any moment that we've been in before, right? There's a lot of things taking place. I mean, we're living through um, a pandemic right now, and, you know, it's important that we're all be safe, by the way, I, if I haven't said that yet, make sure that you're wearing your masks, make sure you're social distancing. Um, but, you know, even just living through the pandemic, this is something that we haven't had something like this happen in over a hundred years. So this is definitely a historical moment. And, it, and it's that type of, or these type of moments that call for us to make historical change, you know, and that's what I think this book is all about and why I'm so happy that um, the Flipgrid team has brought me on um, today because, you know, this this is all about us making the changes that are necessary, um, you know, for, uh, for us to live through better history in the future. So again, you know, thank you to all of you um, for being here and and thank you to um, the Flipgrid team. Um, these have been excellent questions. Um, make sure you all check out uh, Flipgrid uh, and 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 go to um, the, the Flipgrid Discovery uh, when you do check out Flipgrid where they have uh, different classes and education modules and things like that um, where you can learn more, um, not just about you know this conversation and, and the Black Friend, but you know, plenty of other important things um, as well. Um, so with that being said, um, I bid you all goodbye. <laughs>